Howdy, and welcome back to Ben Thinking. I forget still that we changed the name to, to Ben Thinking, but it is it is Ben Thinking. So thank you all for tuning in. Today we have Mr. Max Kutch, and hello, Mr. Max. How are you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. Well, I, I appreciate you taking the time, not really knowing exactly what this is. Ultimately, what this is, where what the goal is, is is partly, I mean, I want other people to be educated and like hear a little bit about your story and all those good things. But at the same time, it gives me an excuse to catch up with people over a longer period of time rather than like a, an odd phone call. I feel like sometimes people are like, all right, now I'm ready to go versus a podcast that are like, they expect a longer formed conversation. So it's kind of just to kind of catch up, honestly. So awesome. Max, take us back to where you're from. Where I'm so from. Scene. So I'm originally from uh, Dallas, Texas, uh, but I moved away when I was 16. Uh, and then I kind of lived all over. Uh, so I joined the military when I was 17 and then, uh, um, I've lived a bunch of different places. Uh, I got out of the military in 2018, moved back to Texas. My wife and I bought a house in college station and both of my kids were born in college station. So I kind of consider that home. Uh, but I'm currently up in Bradford, Vermont. The house y'all bought looks absolutely gorgeous. I mean, the interior looks nice, but I've just seen the exterior of the home. It's in the little Snapchats or the, the Instagrams are yeah. going small. It looks like a nice spot, man. Congratulations. Thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, we bought it sight unseen. It was totally random, and it ended up working out great. It definitely needed some work, uh, but we put some work into it, and that's fantastic. Are you done like with the, the, with the work? Uh, yeah. like There's always like little things to do. Uh, when you own a house, but I would say 95% of it. Yeah. Oh yeah. So why did you decide to, why, why'd you leave, I guess, home at 16 and then why'd you decide to go to the military to different questions? Um, so, so I got into a lot of trouble in high school, middle school, high school. I was not exactly, uh, like a model student, uh, I got arrested a few times. I had been, I got expelled from school twice. Um, uh, what? What, so, were you, what were you, what were you up to? So, uh, so the first time I got expelled from school was in eighth grade. Uh, and uh, it was honestly kind of a, kind of a messed up situation. Uh, and the charges were actually for hazing. Uh, looking back on it, I feel like that was kind of an improper way to classify it. But it was basically uh, me and another friend of mine ended up getting into like a like a water splashing match in the bathroom, and I dumped a bunch of water on him. So it really wasn't anything crazy. Uh, but the school that I was at was not uh, not a big fan of it. So I got expelled for that, and that was in eighth grade. That was a private school, um, and then I got expelled sophomore year of high school. For, I was skipping school and I was one of the few kids that had uh, had a car. So I got a car when I was 15. And uh, I was one of the few kids that had a place that I could buy alcohol. So I went and was buying a bunch of alcohol and I got arrested because I looked 15. Uh, so I, I walked out of a liquor walked out of a liquor store and got arrested. And, uh, because it was during school hours, I got expelled for that one too. Uh, so I ended up going to four high schools in three years. Um, uh, oh, so I went to that private school that I got expelled from. Uh, and then I went to the public high school to finish out the rest of that year. And then I went to a boarding school in Georgia for a year. And then I came back and had a bunch of additional credits um, because the schooling was just a little bit different at the boarding school and, uh, went to a charter school in Richardson, Texas. It was like an at your own pace school. And so I got my last, I only needed one or two classes left and I got them in six weeks. So I graduated early. Um, nice. yeah, but so what is boarding school like boarding school? Yeah. Uh, it was. So the school, the school ended up getting shut down for child abuse. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, looking, cool. ba looking back on it, some of the, it was incredibly formative for me 
later in life. Like I think a lot of the reasons that I excelled in my job in the military was because I had those situations that were, I don't know, less than ideal as a child. Um, but the school itself, um, it was, it was interesting to say the least. So everybody that was there was there for some sort of a disciplinary problem. So it wasn't like a college prep boarding school. It was like a troubled youth boarding school. Okay. So we had like, we had to sleep with the lights on. Uh, and we had people that basically walked up and down the halls all night long. And we had these big 500 pound magnet doors that would shut. And so we'd get locked down on the inside. Damn. Uh, yeah. Uh, but that was also my first real exposure to like working out uh, because there was not much to do. And I also, uh, so like in high school, I was always kind of like a short, chunky kid. Uh, I was like five foot three, five foot four, 150 pounds. I drank a bunch of soda, uh, was not super healthy. Uh, but then when I'm, yeah, when I'm in boarding school, I went from five foot three to five foot 11 uh, over the course of that year. So like I had a huge growth spurt and I, Damn. I went from 150 to like 185, 190. Um, and so that was super formative for me and like learning how to, like, I really fell in love with the gym cause it was something to do. It was an outlet for me. Learn how to move that yeah. newly found larger body. That's, yeah. That's a huge increase in height. I mean, that is a huge growth spurt. Yeah. And what was the, and what the weight difference was uh, from what to what? 150 to like 185, 190. Damn. So it was like a chunky 150 to like a pretty, like, I was definitely much better built at 185, 190. And what were your workouts looking like at that time? Are you working out like in the room or do you guys have like a location? So uh, depending, so we would get uh, like... We would get things taken away based on bad behavior or things given back incentivized incentivary behavior. Uh, but so like we had a regular gym and our gym had uh, predominantly free weights. And then, uh, but sometimes it would get taken away. So me and a couple of the other students would do like calisthenics in our room. But for regular, honestly, I think, I did the, like the standard bodybuilding magazine type workout from the late nineties, early two thousands, like yeah. uh, chest one day, arms one day, back one day, that sort of workout. And, uh, super, super easy split. Yeah. And I honestly don't think I ever squatted the whole time I was there. Uh, <laughs> nice. yeah. Um, uh, what is. Sorry. No, you're good. What what is like a, a misbehavior like that qualifies getting the gym taken away? What, uh, I mean, you're in boarding school and you're still you're still acting up. Yeah, so um <laughs> really it was always like simple stuff. It was like um I'll think of one specific. So <laughs> uh one kid smuggled in a bunch of uh, do you know what triple C's are like Corsidin cough medicine? Nice. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> Fun. Yeah. So a kid smuggled those in one time and uh, um, then it became like a huge ordeal because everybody had to go um, draft up explanations or what happened. And I refused to write. I was like, I was like, no, like, I don't know anything about this kid. Like I didn't do anything and I'm not, I'm not going to just narc on this kid for no reason. Uh, so like that, things like that were how we got the gym taken away. That's good. Yeah. That's kind of shitty. I mean, yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. Or like, I don't know. It was all just small stuff. And they would, uh, we would just have these different punishments that they would do. Like one time, uh, one time we, we had this, like basically forced march type punishment where they gave us stretchers with 40 pound water jugs. And we would just put these water jugs on the stretchers and just go have to walk with them. Uh, Damn. yeah, that's a workout. Yeah, for sure. And so it was, it was really good team building exercise at the time. Cause most of the people there obviously didn't want to do that. It's not like when you're in the military and you sign up for the hardship, like, 
you're much more apt to, to do it voluntarily. Um, and so that sort of situation, it was basically um, having to work through problems as they arose. And I mean, that is, I guess, a lot of what life is, right? Yeah. But obviously to, to like an, the nth degree in the military. Yeah. You're a little choppy. Let's see. You might come back. Um, so started working out yep. and workouts were pretty, pretty classic for the most part. And what was about, what would, what was it about the gym that gave you this, this love or like this, you know, like, it was an escape. I get that. But from what? Yeah, I, I think it was, uh, so I look back at a lot of my childhood and so like my mom, my, my mom and my dad split when I was pretty young. I think it was five when they split. Um, my mother raised me and, uh, I, I don't fault my parents at all. I feel like, especially looking back on it now as a parent myself, I think my parents were doing the best they could with the hand they were dealt. And they always showed me that they loved me. With that being said, I would never raise my kids the way I was raised. Uh, like I basically raised myself. Uh, and so I had very, very little structure or discipline. Um, and I, I was basically free to roam on my own and I was never really challenged, uh, especially not school. Like I hated school and now I love school. Like I really enjoy learning and I like being in school. Um, but at the time, I was not a huge fan of it. And I think that's why I got into a lot of trouble as a child. And I think the first time, like, working out in the gym, uh, it is that, in a in a micro view of it, it's, it is that discipline. It is seeing, like, I can put in effort and uh, I can see a positive return on that effort. Um, and I think if I, if I take a step back, it pays dividends in all aspects of life when you see like the growth and the benefit that you get just in compound interest like the amount of like if you start working out in the gym it doesn't really especially as a new gym goer it doesn't really matter what you do as long as you're consistent with it you will see improvements and like seeing that improvement over time and learning that consistency and discipline were things that paid off and were positive. That was the first time I ever saw any sort of consistency in my life and any sort of discipline. Damn. That's, I mean, that's huge. I mean, that, talk about formative. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah, I, I mean, I agree 100%. I mean, obviously, this is something that I, I care about very much so. And, and it was also a sort of escape for me. Can I get away from like, the the bully or like the the home situation and and I I'm, to to pre to preface I agree my, my parents did the best that they could um, I love them and they, they did wonderful things um, but maybe some of the the things that are that I didn't necessarily agree with um, which is fine um, and it became like there was. I feel like it was the only place to see if I worked, then I got a, re and then there was a, a reward. I felt like, and, th and that mattered in some sort. Like I'm getting stronger. Like there's a benefit here rather than in school. It was like, we're going to, you know, do our ABCs today and they have to follow this exact, like, n like, you know, you have to follow the lines and you have to turn it in. It's like, this sucks. I mean, there, what's, what's the point of this? I, th there was no, almost no purpose versus the gym gave purpose and and in itself has purpose. So it was a lot easier to attach to. Yeah. And like what you're talking about with school, I think the modern education system focuses more on compliance, like sit here, do this, write down what you need to write down and turn it in, be quiet, don't disrupt the class. It's more on compliance than it actually is on the process of learning. And so it wasn't like, I'm an avid reader now. I love to read. I don't think I read a real book like until I was 19 or 20 years old, like the whole way through school. Anytime we'd have assigned readings, I'd get clip notes or I'd ask somebody else to give me some sort of information or I'd try to look something up online uh, to kind of fudge a book report. 
but it was, I think I have like, I've, I've always had kind of a distinct problem with authority. And so school and ed the education system really compounded that. It, that's the, that all they want you to do is say, yes, there, there is no opportunity to ask real questions of why we're doing the thing. It's it, the, the question is, I think maybe they allow for a how, right? The how do I do this thing? And then they'll, they'll educate you on how to do the specific task. But if you start asking why, like conceptually, why are we doing this thing? What long-term benefit does it provide? It's like, stop, stop asking too many questions. And it's like, what, <laughs> that's not, that's not an answer. This doesn't help me. Yeah. It's, and I think part of, I mean, they're dealing with a lot of kids that are probably, you know, that are just pieces of garbage that, you know, they're hoodlums, you know? Um, and so I, I partly get it, but it's at the same time, if you've taken that role, then you have a responsibility to, to teach. Right. Yeah. Um, and there are good teachers out there and there's good coaches out there, but I feel like it's so much easier. I think if you're in that system, it perpetuates the system and, and it's just, just, just do the bare minimum, just get them through the next six weeks. Right. Cause that's what you did. You went through the first six weeks and then you moved on. It's, it just continues this cycle of, of laziness um, and not really wanting to, get down on a knee and talk to a kid and say, well, this is why, right. Or give the kid the opportunity to maybe not do it the exact way, but kind of have their own um, take on it. So long as the task is done, then what does it matter that it's done the way that, you know, you, you want it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I do think that's a, a big problem. Uh, like I kind of live my life by the, the mantra, like, easy decision now, hard life later, hard decision now, easy life later. And so when you make that e easy decision, which is just like appeasing the kid or telling the kid like, hey, this is just how it is, instead of actually giving them an explanation, that kid ends up faltering and like not growing or getting to the potential that they could. Do you think that the military ended up being an educational system or platform that gave you that ability to, to grow? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, so I told you, I graduated high school, uh, early and then I joined the military at 17 and I did that. I took 10 months off. Well, so I was going to take a full year off and then go to college with my, like my grade and 10 months into that, I was just a total bum. Like I literally did nothing. I bounced around. I couch surfed a lot. Uh, but I didn't have a job. Uh, I was, a, I was a bum and, uh, impulse, literal bum. Yeah, yeah, literally, uh, impulsively went to, uh, a Marine Corps recruiter. Um, what's funny about it. So I spent 12 and a half years in the military, but if you would have asked me like two weeks before I joined the Marine Corps, if I knew that I was going to do that, I would have said that I was crazy. Like there was, that was never in my cards. I, I didn't know anybody that was in the military, but so I went to the Marine Corps recruiter and I said, I wanted to be a medic. And then he basically told me, we don't have medics in the Marine Corps. You can go to the Navy, which is next door. And I was like, nah, I don't want to do that. And I go, okay, I want to do the infantry. And he was like, okay, great. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> so I, we got one. Yeah, That's an infantry. We got one. <laughs> um, and so I joined the military. And, um, my first, I don't want it to come off sounding negative because I have so much respect for the infantry. The infantry does the most with the least amount of training, the least amount of equipment. And they are, they're young, 18 to 22 year old kids, basically. Um, and they never ask questions. They just go accomplish things. And it's fantastic. But so like when I joined the military, uh, joined the infantry, um, I quickly learned that there were people making decisions around me that I didn't necessarily want to listen to. Um, and so I kind of break this down. The infantry, uh, has four different or three different types of people. Generally, the kind of people that join the infantry, a third of them have no other option. They probably barely graduated high school. They're not the most intelligent or they're not the most book smarts. 
um, and they couldn't do any other job in the military because to join the infantry is the lowest required educational testing, the ASVAB score. Option two is people that show up because they want to prove something, whether to themselves or to somebody else. And they're kind of not necessarily the strongest or the toughest, but they're saying like, hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to join the Marine Corps and I'm going to join the Marine Corps infantry. And then you have a third of the, the other, the last third are generally average to above average intelligent, probably uh, played sports in high school, sociable, um, really solid dudes, uh, but they're outnumbered two third to one third. And generally after four years time, most of those guys, most of the guys with a solid head on their shoulder, get out of the infantry. And so you're promoted on rank based on the amount of time that you've been in and not necessarily your actual um, leadership quality or your leadership ability. And some of that is cultivated into people in the military, but you end up having people that have stayed in for a long amount of time. So 12, 14 years that are making decisions for people that have been in two and three years that are just not very smart decisions. Uh, but if you're that guy that's been in two or three years, you kind of just shut up in color and you do it, you deal with it. And that's what you do. Cause that's the hierarchy and the structure of the military. And if you ask questions or you did think you tried to like second guess or question things, the machine as a whole would not function properly. And so real early on, I learned, I was like, okay. I've got to get out. I've got to get around other like-minded individuals. And so I volunteered for the sniper platoon. Uh, and I took uh, like an indoctrination process, like a, a selection process, and I was selected. And I got into the sniper platoon. And that was the first time of being around other guys that I thought were really intelligent. They all like raised their hand and volunteered to go basically one step further. And so... I spent my first deployment in the sniper platoon um, while I was in the infantry. That's crazy. I mean, I think to to recognize the hierarchy, the structure, and noticing that I'm going to – obviously, you had some sort of long-term plan with the military, right? Are you – is a minimum four years? Yep. Like when you first sign up – okay. So then you knew you're going to be here at least for – three or two, two more years at that point, three more years. So to have the, the forethought to be able to say, yeah, these, you know, these, these aren't my people. Uh, and to find a group, I think is, it's cool. Yeah. Why'd you choose, why'd you choose snipers of all of them? Uh, so um, in a regular infantry battalion, um, I'm going to probably mess the numbers up, but I think there's like four or 500 guys. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, ish. Ish. Uh, but a sniper puts in, like, so mine was four teams of six. Uh, so 20, 24 guys and then some headquarters. So let's say we had 25 or 26 guys. So the, those individuals all are much more physically fit than the average infantry person because you have to pass a physical indoctrination. Uh, much more mentally adept. And then they're constantly testing and improving all the time. So it's uh, like you're never, you're never a, we would say like drop a rock. Like you don't ever set your pack down and just like calm down because it's always, it's always seeking self-improvement. Um, and I admired that about the sniper platoon. And I honestly didn't really know very much about snipers other than they were, um, an all volunteer unit of guys that were going to be, be better trained, be better trained than everybody else. Uh, so I deployed with them. Um, and then I came back in 2007 and I decided that I wanted to take one step further. Uh, and so the Marine Corps, before yeah. We before we go one step further, can we talk about the indoctrination program? Like yeah. the difference between your prime, like the initial indoctrination versus the, the uh, basic. Yeah. So, um, so like Marine Corps boot camp is 
uh, I think it's 12 weeks long. I don't honestly remember. Something like that. Two or three months. And was uh, and another question before yeah. that, I guess. Well, I mean, you didn't realize you were going to make the decision, right? And then two weeks later, you're here in this office making your decision to sign up. Do you like? Do you just sign that day? How does that? How does that work? Um. So I went to the recruiting office in October, and October is when fiscal year starts. Uh. So like. At all money, all numbers on books in the military basically resets in October. And all recruiters, I didn't know any of this at the time. I only learned this after the fact. All recruiters have certain quotas that they need to hit. So they need five intelligence Marines or three motor T guys or two mechanics or two aircraft, whatever. Um, yeah. X number of infantry guys. And so when I showed up and I said I wanted to join the infantry the guy said okay you can leave next week basically and i said i'd really prefer to stay home and leave in january because i want to hang out for the holidays like i don't want to go spend christmas and new year's and thanksgiving in boot camp Fair. and he basically said well there's no guarantee that there will be an infantry slot at that point, I was like, okay, I'll come back later and we'll figure it out. And so I left and I came back uh, right after Christmas. So it was like the 27th of December. And I said, hey, <clears throat> I'd like to go infantry. And he goes, you can leave January 3rd. I said, perfect. So he got me a plane ticket and I flew out, uh, flew out to uh, California and went to boot camp. Damn, yeah. that's kind of cool. Yeah. That's, it worked out. I mean, are there a limited number of infantry spots? Are they that scarce? No. Are, are there? Are, okay, no, no. Yeah. I was like, he, <laughs> he was. I think he was just trying to fill. Like, I don't know. I think he was just trying to fill quotas and try to get as many as he could in that month. Yeah, of course. Yeah. He gets paid per right. It's like it's like a commission. So yeah, it's not necessarily that he gets paid per, but they do they do get some sort of a. I'm not sure how it works. I don't think it's financial incentive, though. Okay, I, I thought I, for whatever reason I thought I remember have, having a memory that they got paid like either a bonus or something. Like if they get like these X amount number of people in this month, um, but whatever yeah. it may be. Um, so then you show up, and are you excited? Are you like, holy shit, what did I just do? Yeah, sort of. Uh, so I had shoulder length hair uh, when I joined, so like they shave all your hair off in boot camp. Um, and I don't know, like I wasn't, so like you always hear these stories, of these guys that like were top of their class in boot camp or whatever the case is. Like I was just kind of gray, man. Like I wasn't anything special, wasn't like a squad leader or like a leadership billet. Um, just kind of, just kind of chugging along, uh, nothing negative, nothing positive. Just existing. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I mean, that's pretty cool. I mean, yeah. Was it tough at all? Like aggressive? Um, no, no, it was. So everybody gets sick. Uh, so if you take a hundred people from all over the country and you put them into like a tight squad bay, which they're all living in this big open air room and you don't really have like hygiene is not the primary thing you do and like you're kind of stressed out because you're always running around and then you're like out in the cold and the wet so like everybody gets sick a lot of people got pneumonia honestly but um Damn. pushing through like the mental aspect of like man when you're sick you really don't want to do anything you just want to lay in bed and be a bum and like but you can't do that and so that was a uh that was a good learning point. But in general, it's not, especially um, in comparison to other things that I did in my military career, it's not really that challenging. Um, I'd never ran more than a mile before I joined boot camp, before I went to boot camp. Um, cool. And so that was, running was definitely, I was never a, a big runner. Uh, that was something I had to pick up and learn while I was there. I mean, you, and then just side note, you just, you just ran uh, a 20, 35K, right? 35K for my 35th birthday. Yeah. It's 23 miles. Oh yeah. 
Dude, I have Sessor, I have Sessor right now. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, dude. I mean, I can't. You, and so, I, as you said, you haven't run more than like three miles this yeah, year. Yeah, I haven't run more than uh, three, three and a half, something like that in the last year. And I was like, I'd fucking madness. Yeah, just nat- natural ability, just go on it. And I just, just don't stop. And uh, it sucks. But there's also like, there's some sheer beauty in like the meditative power of controlling, controlling your body and like the highs and lows that come with ex- like long distance running. I just love. Dude, there's this quote that I really love and I try to live my life by, which is, uh, I like to treat my body in a rigorous manner so it won't be disobedient to the mind. Um, so like whether I think that's, that's Seneca. yeah, exactly. So whether that's yeah. like going and getting in cold water or like going out on a long run or like just beat myself up occasionally. Um, do you do out. ice baths and stuff like that now? What's that? Yeah. Do you do ice baths and stuff now? Yeah. So like, um, I don't have a cold tank or anything like that, but, up here in Vermont, the Connecticut River freezes over. And so me and a couple of my classmates, I got my wife to do it a couple of times too, would go bust holes in the river and go jump in the river. It is... Uh, Y'all are insane. Dude, it is wild. It is wild. <laughs> I've never done any sort of cold stuff before coming up here. Uh, I actually really like the cold and I love winter. And uh, so, I, yeah, dude, I grew up basically down south most in texas california north carolina majority of my time so i was just thought i didn't like the cold um but like coming up here and living up here in the winter i love it uh i feel like when i walk outside like the cold gives me energy whereas the heat kind of saps your energy i i like going outside when it's hot as shit and getting like a nasty workout yeah it's a different kind of hurt that I absolutely love, but cold is what well. I like going like when it was rain, like snowing in College Station. It, I put on a good little jacket and some some tights and some shorts and went out for a run. And it was like just it is so meditative. You can watch your breath and just like it just relax through it. And like went for I don't know probably not a super long run, probably like six to ten miles something like that. But it was like it was just it's nice. I like the cold as well. It does give energy there's something about like having even just like a cup of coffee and sitting outside when it's cold yeah it just feels so good for sure all right so uh, back to okay we uh forget where we were so we were talking about boot camp a little bit and i was talking about the sniper platoon yeah okay so then now we got to being in yeah so your first indoctrination yeah so so um <laughs> so i i broke my hand I uh, broke uh, uh, two uh, two bones in my hand in a street fight. Of being an idiot, I, I just punched wrong. <laughs> uh, in no or December, it was on New Year's Eve in two thousand six, and uh, so I when I checked in when I was at the infantry battalion, but the sniper in doc was two weeks later. And I took a little Gerber, uh, like folding, folding saw and cut my cast off in my barracks room so I could take the end doc because I couldn't take the end doc with my, my cast on. So I cut my end doc, cut my, uh, cast off so I could go. And it's a bunch of physical events. So it's, I think my end doc was six days long. Um, and you basically do just a mix of physical and mental tests. So like we do mental tests or we do these things called chem games, which are like keep in memory. And, uh, one of the, one of the snipers in the platoon would show you 10 items basically. And you'd have 60 seconds to look at these 10 items and then you'd go do some sort of physical activity, whether it's running or just getting thrashed basically. And then you would have to list it down all these 10 items, their size, shape, description, color. Um, and it's, it's just a training process that carries over really well for actual combat. Uh, just being able to keep things in your memory that are super pertinent, uh, even under physical duress. And so 
they put you under these stress situations and see how well you can perform. And so we would do those. Um, we did uh, we did some pool work, uh, which is pretty rare in the infantry uh, to just make sure people could swim. Um, and at the very end of it, so during the, you also do like just a physical fitness test. Um, which is a three mile run, max number of pull ups and max number of crunches. And I got like nine pull ups, which is, is pretty. So, in a, a regular, uh, like a more elite unit, so like snipers or recon or Marsoc, most guys are getting 18 to 20 pull ups, maxing out the points on a pull up score. But so I only got nine. And so during my interview process, after the five days is over, they wanted to know, like, they were like, hey, you seem physically great, uh, except for your pull-ups. Like, what's up with that? And I basically explained that I cut my cast off the day before the indoc started. And uh, so I haven't done pull-ups in, like, I don't know, close to a month. Um, and <laughs> But I guess I've gave them the right answers and so they selected me um but i was super out of how many what's that out of how many um i don't remember let's see i think my indoc had 25 guys and i think we had four or five get selected five maybe Damn. something like that nice um and then um then so once you get selected into a sniper platoon a sniper platoon is broken down into hogs and pigs and a hog is a hunter of gunmen which is a school trained scout sniper somebody who's been through the formal schooling um and then a pig is a professionally instructed gunman it's basically the scout it's the the guy that's learning everything so they can go to school uh and so one of the things that a pig does is you from the time you get into the platoon you wear what's called a pig egg which is just a a ruck with 60 pounds in it or 50 55 or 60 pounds in it and you run everywhere you go uh Fuck. dude it's hard, hard. Shit, so like dude, uh, yeah God, but like you run to you run to go eat lunch. You run back to your barracks. You run like all day long. All we did <laughs> is run places with this heavy pack on. And so it wasn't really like, there wasn't really gym work, but we would do like calisthenics. So push ups, pull ups, ruck runs, stuff like that. Uh, and then a whole lot of just mental, mental uh, training and then gun work. Uh, like just getting proficient on the rifles. Um, I then deployed to Iraq in uh, February, I think February 2007. Something like that. So at this point, you're still a pig. Yep. Yeah. So I deployed on my first deployment as a pig. So my. And what's that? Are you paired with a hog every, like every, everywhere you go, are you paired with a guy? Yeah. So, or in so our team, so we had, uh, our teams were broken down as six man teams. So my six man team had, um, we had two hogs. So our team leader and our ATL was a hog. And then we had four, four pigs. Um, this is also my first exposure to medical training. So um, we had four teams, but only one like Navy corpsman, one real trained medic for the whole state platoon. And so they basically asked for volunteers, one person from each team to get a little bit of additional training to help help the team out since we were going to go out in remote areas and not have a medic. And so I volunteered for that and I really enjoyed it. Looking back on it, especially some of the medical work that I did when I was at Marsoc, uh, it was all like super basic medical care, um, but it was just enough to get by. Um, it's enough to keep somebody alive yeah. is the goal? Yeah. Uh, the goal is basically uh, stop bleeding, make sure that they can breathe, and get a me back out of there. 
that's no, those are good skills to learn, yeah. especially as a as a new coming doctor yeah. and that kind of stress. Like those are probably good skills. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was really great because that was the first time that I. So I'm I'm getting I'm getting these positive rewards in like volunteering for the staples in and like liking the people I'm around and then volunteering uh, to learn medical work and like enjoying that aspect of it. And so I'm getting all of these perks that I'm, I'm being positively incentivized, um, on that deployment. Uh, so we deployed Iraq and not a ton happened. It wasn't like a super kinetic deployment. Uh, the, there was like this one really pivotal uh, firefight that happened in that deployment that I think really impacted me for the rest of my military career. Uh, so my team leader at the time, uh, <clears throat> so we were in a hide site. And so a hide site is like a, with, yeah. um, you go to, just a position. So this was an abandoned house that we were in and we're set up with surveillance and a, a sniper rifle. And we're basically just keeping eyes out on a roadway to see if there's anything. The predominant thing we're looking for is guys implanting uh, improvised explosive devices. And uh, <clears throat> during this one specific, op so we would normally go out for two or three days at a time and we would just stay on surveillance and rotate uh, who's on the gun and who's on the radio the whole time. And then, so you have one down security, one guy on the gun and one guy on the radio, and you just have the other three guys basically sleeping and you rotate through. Um, and the infantry unit that we were with got into kind of a firefight and they had, uh, they had a couple of guys get injured and they had, uh, uh like an evac that was coming, an evacuation that was coming to pick those guys up. And we're looking out in the canal and there's uh, three military age males. So I don't know, 16 to 30 year old guys basically hiding in the reeds in the canals. And this is like midnight or one in the morning. And so there's a curfew at that time, no matter what. So the guys are not out doing anything good, but my team leader, was so hesitant and fearful of um, doing something wrong and then getting punishment or rep or reprimanded for that he basically like called it in and reported it, but didn't do anything. And uh, we were a hundred percent within our rights with our rules of engagement at the time to engage those guys. Uh, but we didn't. And then the next morning, a Humvee drove over that road in that same spot and functioned a 500 pound IED and it killed the turret gunner, uh, who's this 18 year old kid, and it blew him out of the turret and then uh, really, really messed up the driver of the vehicle. And so we're 400 meters away from these guys. So we go down and we're the first responders on this vehicle. And so this is my, like one of my first medical experiences and it's not really medical experience at the time because they were so messed up. There was really nothing that I could do. Um, but that was a very, um, critical point in my life that I was like, I'm not, if I think that there's the right move, because I was the youngest person on that team, I was 18 years old at the time. Youngest person on the team, most junior guy on the team, not just age wise, but just rank and everything in the military. And so in the regular structure and hierarchy of the military, like I would never speak up and ask questions or like give my point of view. Um, and I learned basically at that point that I was like, no, nah, I'm never doing that again. Like it hurt like deep down in my belly to know that there was literally something we could have done to prevent that. And there's nothing to say a hundred percent that we could have prevented it. Uh, but it's very likely that those guys were there either implanting or hooking up the, that device. 
Um, and so like, that was, that was one of the driving factors that made me decide to leave, uh, the conventional military and try out for special operations when I got back from that deployment. Damn. What a, what an, ex- I mean, what an experience. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think validation for like the rest of your life to kind of trust your gut and to kind of speak up. Yeah. And yeah. For your military career as well. But I, out on being on the outside of it, I think about what that would, that, what that story would do for me or that experience would do for me. And it's like that, that it, it's validation every single time I want to, I think that I should say something. I, I, I should say it. And if I get reprimanded or somebody yells at me, then, the worst case scenario is that they yell at me and best case is that I saved a couple guys' lives. Yeah. You know, like I mean that's and maybe not in civilian world would it be saving lives, but at the same time it also very well could be, right? It's um in the, seeing a kid I don't know, um maybe uncomfortable around an adult and it's like, Hey mom, dad, I'm just seeing something here. I don't know this this is something real, but you never know that, that you know, that kid might be, you know, they're they're uncle or babysitter or whatever you might as well just say something yeah and a hundred percent you never know a hundred percent and there's a whole saying that we used to say in the military like i'd rather get tried by 12 than carried by six um and it's it's one of those things that i don't i don't believe a lot of different like i don't know i hate it sounds like sounds like i'm talking shit but like a lot of woo woo things uh, but, That's fair. but I do a hundred percent believe in intuition and like your gut feeling, uh, it's something that if you discount it, like there's definitely, there's definitely repercussions that can be had because you're just totally discounting that, that point of view. I think that I struggle with like trusting that intuition at times because yeah. I feel like there are there, if there, you see a pattern or a pattern has existed in your previous, in your previous existence and you're bringing that maybe not, not a correct pattern of thought into a maybe more healthy situation and you're trusting your, what you would know as your intuition and it, it not, it leads you to, to a safe place, right? The, the whole goal is that our brain is working and creating these patterns or stores patterns so that we don't have to work as hard in the future. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's what that intuition is. It's a, it's analyzing all this data and then elicits a feeling. And sometimes the, the data you grew up in, isn't the data that even though it might look the same, isn't the data that you're currently in today. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I struggle in this like balance of, well, is this a previous pattern of, of thought that isn't, that didn't lead me in the right direction, but maybe at one point kept me safe and now I no longer need that. Or is it something that I should trust? Uh, That is, I think that there's a lot of power to, to the intuition, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very odd power. Like it feels yeah. weird. It feels nasty at times. Um, but for sure learning. Yeah. And it can totally, it can totally be maladaptive. Like what you're talking about, like something that was beneficial maybe when you're a child, but it's still coming up and presenting. And I think as I get older, the um, responding instead of reacting, like basically taking a second from that initial thought that pops into my head and being like, okay, how, how should I respond to this? And like, it helps like basically parse out more what is real and what's really important and what's true and like, what's not, and that's not always right, but at least, at least makes it a little bit smoother. It, that, that wild, um, think before you speak, you know, that, that yeah. weird adage for whatever reason, it's like they knew what they were talking about. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, you're, you're, so in Marsoc, I guess, I guess that's where, that's where, so question, is this your first experience with, with death? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that kid, they got blown up, uh, 
me coming up on him was the first time I'd ever seen a dead body. Like I had been hunting and seen dead animals. I'd killed animals before, but that was the first time I'd seen a dead human being. Was it tough? I mean, was it like, or you're, you're, you're so in the moment that it, you don't, don't necessarily think about it. So I didn't really think about it at the time. Uh, so I had a poncho, this, I would go, uh, I'll go down this rabbit hole in a second. So like a poncho, like a, a large tarp that I took out of my backpack and I put and covered over this guy. Um, but honestly, I didn't really didn't really process it or think about it at the time for sure. Once everything was done and I was back at our regular base, uh, I thought about it quite a lot. Uh, like, especially like that night as I was going to bed. Um, but at the actual time I didn't really, you just kind of, kind of go through what you're, ha what you have to do at the time. And don't let any sort of emotions or anything else get in the way. Like, definitely compartmentalization. Uh, so the little side tangent. So there's one, I like to, <laughs> I like to think of myself as being like, I like, I like people. Uh, and I like to see the good in people. And I really, really, really do my best to not ever hold grudges. Uh, there is one person throughout my entire life that I feel like I still like slightly hold a grudge against, but he was a guy in the platoon and he was one of my senior, uh, senior hogs in the platoon. Uh, but he, uh, he tried to write me up and give me administrative paperwork for losing gear. Uh, because I gave that, because I put the poncho on that kid and, uh, uh he basically like took it up to a, like a company level offense that I was missing or unaccountable for gear. And it was really, really frustrating for me. Uh, but when I was selected for Marsa, after I went to selection and I came back, I was so grateful uh, to know that I wouldn't have to deal with people like him. Uh, you're, you're whittling down this pool of maybe less ideal people. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so like Marsoc as a whole, when I was there and I don't know what the numbers are now, uh, but when I was there, there was 535 special operators in all of Marsoc. So like a, it's a relatively small tight knit group of dudes and everybody that's there has been through the same one month selection process the same year long training process. Uh, it's called individual training course. Uh, Damn. yeah. And so everybody's been through the same hardship. Everybody does the same workups and then everybody deploys. Generally everybody deploys. So like, uh, it was, it was really, really nice to be around uh, incredibly intelligent, incredibly articulate, well-spoken, smart, uh, physically fit guys that you knew that you could count on no matter what. Uh, like I was always, always, always like surrounded by people that I was like, I would, I looked up to everybody that I worked with and that was fantastic because I couldn't say the same thing. Not again. I still, like, like I said, I have nothing against the infantry, but there were definitely a lot of guys in the infantry that I did not look up to. I mean, I th again, I think just reiterating that point, it's like you whittled away or cut away the fat. Yeah. And it's not that, it's not that the, that fat necessarily is, is wrong in that space. You, you kind of, it needs to exist. Right. And, I don't, I don't know if this is okay to say, but ultimately, yeah, at one point, you need you need bodies, you need numbers, right? Yeah. So you kind of need that population there. But once you, by the time you get to Marsoc, you're working with a a better group, a higher tiered group of guys. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's pretty. I mean, it's pretty wild. What is the what is the one year? I didn't realize it was a it was a this longest of a selection. So. Do they come and approach you? Do you volunteer for it? And then uh, what does that one month and then one year individual look like? Yeah, so the uh, uh, you volunteer for it. Um, there's a, like a paperwork selection process. 
to initially get you a seat to what's called assessment and selection or ANS. Um, and then once you pass the paperwork, which is basically like your GT score, which is your general technical, it's just a military test score to say that you're smart enough to on a passing a, a written test, um, vision score, swim qual, basically saying you can swim and a physical fitness test. Um, you go and you go to, um, you get orders cut to assessment and selection. And the first part of it is all psychological evaluations. Um, a bunch of different psych tests, basically physical test. And then they, they strip your name. So you just get given a number. Uh, you don't know anybody's rank. And we started with 103 guys. And you go through this process and little by little, people just disappear. They just don't make the times. They don't, they quit, whatever the case is. Little by little, it whittles down. And then I think it's the second to last or third to last day, there's like a board process, which a board is you walk into a room, you sit down, there's like U-shaped tables around you and you're sitting in the middle and there's 10 to 15 higher ranking individuals from the command and they ask questions <laughs> and they've seen your progress over the last month and they basically yes or no you coming to the community and so <clears throat> I did that so you whittled down to about 50 for the board and then I think we selected 31 or 32 31 or 32 out of the 103. Um, Damn. Yeah. And uh, physically, it's hard. It's physically hard. It's challenging. Uh, you are on your feet all day long. Uh, and you've got a, a heavy pack with you. And you're constantly either doing land navigation, so moving from point to point without roads in the middle of the woods, or you are... Uh, doing different exercises like um, <clears throat> like moving like a 200 pound casualty dummy from point A to point B, and they're evaluating how your team working about how your team workability is. Um, is it difficult to work as a team in those situations? Um, yes and no. Um, it's not because everybody's there for a common goal. Um, I would say it's slightly difficult because you don't know your rank or hierarchy that everybody in the military is really used to. So MARSOC's a little bit different than the other special operations groups of so the SEALs or the Army SF because you have to have done, now I think it's four years, I'm not sure. You have to have done time in the regular conventional military before you can try out for MARSOC. Whereas the the SEALs or the Army Green Berets, you can just come in off of the street. And as long as you pass all the qualifications, that's what you become. But so there's already kind of an ingrained uh, rank structure built in. And so some people have a little bit of an issue. Say you're a higher ranking individual. They have a hard time being basically told what to do um, because they're used to telling people what to do. Um but those people, honestly, it's a good test and it ends up weeding out people because <clears throat> in Morsock, it was always billet over rank. So it's not necessarily <clears throat> how long you've been in the military, but it's how well you know your job. If you're the subject matter expert in that job, then you can, your voice holds a higher weight. That's cool. Yeah. I like that. And it kind of, it strips that the the ego yeah. away right you're used to this this given respect and you now have to have yeah. value to to add to the team to validate your your words yeah i like that yeah. that's kind of cool yeah they have definitely so like we modeled it we model our selection process and our uh it's called itc the individual training course we model it a lot after the Army Special Forces uh, because they have a very similar type process and they've been doing it since I think the 70s. Um, <clears throat> but it's really, really efficient and it works really well at getting uh, a certain type of individual um, 
that is successful in our job. Hell yeah. So now you're in, are you traveling throughout your time <laughs> during your, your year of, of ITC or is it at one specific base? So it's at one location at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Um, so it's like kind of the southeastern coast of North Carolina. <clears throat> and the first three months is kind of like a, like a hazing phase, is at least when I went through. Like, it's a little bit different now, uh, but we weren't allowed to leave the base. Uh, and we, it was basically like a three-month boot camp, uh, except a boot camp specifically for guys coming over to Marsoc. Um, and, was this the first time you started getting physically challenged? Um, so I was physically challenged to an extent in cyber, the cyber platoon, but these were more like, dude, I was, so in the infantry and in the cyber platoon, I was always, always in the top one or two guys physically. Um, when I got over to Marsoc, I was like half middle of the pack. Because everybody coming from all over the entire military were all the, the top one or two guys. And so, like, it was it was super humbling yeah. coming around these dudes that were all, all the smartest dudes, the guys that were the best shot on a rifle or a pistol, the guys that were uh, the most tactically proficient, the most physically fit. So, like, I think it does a lot to propel and excel your level of excellence when you're around other guys that are also super high. It's like the whole saying, like, if you're the biggest fish in your pond, you need to change ponds. Oh, yeah. And you will get bigger, yeah. right? I mean, it, it it's like also the sum of your five friends is, is kind of like who, who you are. And if you continue to hang around with good people, good, intelligent people that are trying to push themselves and grow, then you're going to, you're most likely also on that same track. Sure. And I think that it gets, it gets a bad rap to like drop the fat. Like if, if you see people that you're riding with and you don't, then you start seeing like, now, now we're just drinking all the time or now we're just, you know, we're, we're not really studying. We're not like, we're not growing in some sort of way. And then it's like, Oh, well, I guess we're not going to chat as much yeah. and, and that's okay. But I feel like it's, it's seen as, <clears throat> man, how could you do that to me? We were friends. Like, well, yeah, but we're, we're different. We're, we're moving at different paces. Here. Yeah. And there's the whole, uh, the whole adage that <clears throat> every seven years you become a new person, basically like the amount of change that people grow through in seven years is like pretty drastic. And so like, if you have friends from 10 or 15 years ago, you either grow, grow together or you grow apart. Uh, and like, I still have those friends, but I would say on the friend structure ranking, they're closer to like buddies or acquaintances. Uh, whereas like my friends, like who I call like my good friends are people that have also grown with me. We have the same sort of mindset. We have the same sort of, uh, we improve on each other and we grow with each other. I love yeah. it. I love it. I mean, you're obviously you're taking that into action. I mean, I think that it's you have a lot of people that that talk about it, and then you have people that are actually living that that reality. And the fact that you came out, I mean, you had you had a achieved a high level of a success. I mean, we're not even all the way through with Marsak. We're going to come back, but like to to get to that point where you came all the way through, and then had a full career through Marsak, and then to come out and then go to A and M, and then have success in powerlifting and then to have sex and success in, in academia as well. And now, you know, you're now you're at Dartmouth and studying medicine. Like it's crazy, dude. Like, and those are the kind of people that you want to like hang around. Like it's, it's, and I th started thinking a little bit more about the podcast and it's like, the, sure the five closest friends, but then all at the same time, like the more that I talk to people who are, achieving big things and doing big things you kind of you get to hear a lot of the cool stories but then the people that are listening if they continue like i think people like to associate um specific people with specific uh like and put them in boxes yeah. it makes it easier for themselves um and so if if 
I want to create like a set of boxes where it's like, oh, we're going to, you know, we can be here and your five closest friends are, they can be in your ear, you know, like you're surrounded, like even if it's subconscious, you're hearing all these people talk about how they're improving and what they're doing in their life. And just the more that you're around it, the the more likely that you're going to, 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 to fall, to fall in line, if you will. A hundred percent. I firmly believe that you are what you consume. So like, if you are constantly like, so like me personally, I like to, I like to read philosophy. I like to read science and educational medical stuff. Uh, and don't get me wrong. I still sometimes will like doom scroll YouTube and just like numb my brain, but I really try to do it as minimally as possible because I know that what you, what you put into your body on a regular basis is what you become it's the same exact it's just the parallel of you are show me your five friends and i'll show you who you are uh your friends in today's day and age can be what you're watching on tv or what you're scrolling through on instagram or uh it's whatever you're surrounding yourself with for most the most time of the day it's we are training our brains to think a specific way. Every time you're listening to somebody, every time that you're reading a book, like you're, you're every time you read, especially I, I like philosophy. I, I got into to stoicism quite a bit a couple of years ago and just reading how to control your emotions and what, like, how are you going to, to treat others and treat yourself? And it, it is, it is food for your brain yeah. and what you're putting in there really does matter. And I, and I love a good comedy podcast. I, I like comedy podcasts a lot because they like, they're the best talkers, right? Their, their job is to talk. And so what can I learn from them and how, uh, like what they, they, if you listen to the, the like the nuanced of uh, the nuances of the yes. And right. Like they're, they're they use a yes. And, um, principle in, 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 um, um, it's, it, it starts with an I, but I cannot remember it's improv, um, to keep the conversation going. Cause if you say a no or a, but then it, it, it ends the conversation. So like if, if I'm with a client and I say no, right. Then the conversation kind of dies. Or it, 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 it's a drop off. You can even hear in the, 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 the frequency of the of the word no right versus a yes it, it it picks up and so you can continue to 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 follow that energy um i i kind of like energies and stuff i think vibes are a real yeah. thing vibes energies whatever you want to call it um and i think it's it's ultimately just our brain picking up on all this data and then giving us a giving us a feeling and people call that vibes or yeah. whatever they like to um so i think that picking up on on and understanding other people's vibe or is is important and the more that you talk to more people the better i think that you get it and so i like comedy podcasts for for lots of different reasons i think that they're 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 the best communicators out there yeah right? yeah for sure that's what they do for a living Maybe. yeah that, that's what they, they just stand up for a living right so like it, it's it's the it's the coolest thing but there there's a reason behind it right there's there's a they're 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 providing a value so long as i'm not listening just to numb myself but i'm listening for a reason then then it it, be, it can become valuable um when you know if i'm tr trying to educate right then then it, it makes sense but if not if i'm scrolling on tiktok which i do do then maybe not the best use of time yeah for sure for sure. So, um, sorry, on a tangent. So, Marsoc, what traveling or like yep. you finish, right? I yep. guess, I guess that's where we're at. You, you finish with your training. Yep. So I finished the training, uh, and I immediately go over to third grader battalion, which at the time was called, uh, God, I think it was M. So I get the time. It doesn't particularly matter, but so I go over to third grader battalion which was central they the way the battalions were set up at that time was uh first and second were going predominantly to afghanistan and centcom and third was going to africa and east asia so philippines thailand uh guam and so i went to africa went to west africa first um and i went to mali and was predominantly doing a train, advise, and assist mission. 
uh, where we would work with the Malian uh, military, train them up, uh, get them ready so they could go um, basically fight the uh, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. So like the North North Africa, there was a, a couple of different terrorist factions that they would go uh, engage with. Um, it was an interesting deployment because there were, when I was there, there were nine U.S. service members outside of the capital in Bamako, and we were probably seven or eight hours away from there. Like, there was nobody around. It was just us in the middle of nowhere. Uh, Damn. And so that was, that was a really cool, unique experience. And when you live in the culture, when you immerse yourself in the culture, it's just, it's just totally different. It's different than anything I'd ever experienced before. So then I came back and I deployed again with them to West Africa again in uh, Senegal. Um, same sort of mission, same sort of uh, deployment. And then uh, came back and uh, transferred from third over to second, uh, which was the Afghanistan mission. So I got to second in 2011 and uh, got on to a team and basically almost immediately headed to uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and that Afghanistan deployment was predominantly in the mountains uh, for the first half of it um, in uh, this place called Dari Boom. And then uh, we were down south in Helmand for the other half of it in a place called Shurike. So what is a what does a deployment look like? I feel like there's so many movies like 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 oh, there's that sni- there's a movie about snipers right? I forget I forget the name of it. Um, but is it? But what is it actually like being in a space? Is it pretty quiet? Are you active? What does it look like? They're all unique and all different. Uh, so, like for example, uh, I'll give you three different types of deployments. So. The first one in Africa, in Mali, uh, we had one building that was air conditioned, but it was just one square building that we lived in. Our tactical operations center was in there. Our kitchen, our like hangout room was all in this one building on a Malian military base, just in the middle of the desert in Saharan Africa. Um, we drove around pickup trucks. Uh, we went out and bought our groceries out in the local town, in a town called Gao. Um, we never wore body armor. Uh, we always carried guns with us, but like we wore civilian clothes. Um, so there's that type of a deployment. My Afghanistan deployment in 2012 in Shurike, uh, we were in a it's called a village stability platform, but it was basically like a, an outpost. It was a heavily fortified compound in the center of the green zone, which is basically like the, the green lush area near the Helmand river. Um, and we gun fought every single day, uh, every day, Usually 6 to 8 a.m., we'd get into a gunfight, and then somewhere around 5 or 6 p.m., we'd get into a gunfight. They would attack the base every single day. And when they weren't attacking the base, we were out running small small ambush patrols like through the, through the canals and through the greenery. Um, but it was a very, very kinetic-type deployment. And we got in all of our stuff from airdrops because people couldn't drive in because they'd get blown up if they tried to come in. Um, and we, I like called home once a month maybe because we didn't have access to stuff like that. Uh, it was just a very rough type deployment. Uh, but like the epitome of what a, uh, what I think of as like a, like a war fighter, that type of a deployment. And then, I deployed. It oddly enough sounds. Uh, it, sorry to cut you off, but it sounds attractive on the outside. You yeah, know? but is it is it that attractive? Um, it sounds kind of strange to say it, um, but it's 
it's the purest form of life. You, there's nothing to worry about. Like there's a lot to worry about in the case that your life is on the line every single day. Uh, but there's nothing to worry. About. The things that don't matter, don't matter. Like you don't care about what's on TV. You don't care about bills. You don't care about your car running out of gas. Like there's, it's, uh, it's pure. Uh, and when you're in that sort of life or death situation, um, everything whittles down to like what's really important and what's not. Uh, and you learn that you can rely on the people you're around and they can rely on you. And there's like something inherently beautiful about that. Um, it's meditative yeah. almost like listening to it. It sounds like a meditation. Yeah, for sure. It's like a, it's like a seven or eight month meditation. Uh, and then you come home, and you come home and it's so different. And like, it's politicized in Hollywood and you'll see like in the, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Hurt Locker. I'm not like a, yeah, not a super huge fan of the movie, but there's a scene where he's like diffusing bombs in Iraq and then he comes home and the next scene is him walking through the grocery store and he's like looking at all the different cereal and he's like not overwhelmed but like just looking at it and it's like what the fuck like just uh it's different um uh, because like there's not you don't think about stuff like that uh, the only things you think about are important things um you're not worried about the the how many calories yeah. in this cereal versus that cereal you just need fucking food yeah. <laughs> and then so like the other deployment so like in 2016 i deployed to kurdistan to northern iraq uh we were fighting isis with the kurds and where i was living there i had like we were on a kurdish base but i had my own room i had air conditioning we had like running water i had wi-fi in my room i facetimed my wife every day and like nice. yeah we still went out and did stuff like really regularly but it was just a very different type of deployment and so like every deployment is is different and every location is different so like when i was up in the mountains in afghanistan everywhere we moved we moved around on dirt bikes and ATVs and we were just navigating these little goat trails and up in the mountains and we would have like pretty long gate long range engagements. Um whereas down in Helmand everything is real close and the biggest everything was on foot uh down in Helmand. So like just different environments, different deployments. And you are a, I mean you're a sniper but in in a short um, in a cl more close combat, what do you do? You carry the same weapon? Or are you still doing the same job? Yeah. So, um, so after I went to sniper school, so after I got over to Morsak, I went to sniper school, and uh, um, I always carried one of three guns with me. So I always carried what's known as a SAS, which is a Sixteen-inch barrel semi-automatic, uh, like a, it's like an AR-15 or an AR-10. Uh, it looks like an AR-15, except it's got a 308 bullet um, and a scope. Hot damn! So I carried that as my primary. So most people would carry like M4s or M16 type weapon. Uh, I carried the SAS, so I could use it as a sniper rifle if I need to. It's really designed out to 800 or so, um, but I've pushed it out further than that. But then you can also use it up close if you need to. So it's the best of both worlds, in my opinion. And then I also cool. I also had a bolt action 300 Win Mag sniper rifle, and then I also had a 50 caliber Sasser, which is a like a long range sniper rifle for either vehicles or really long distance. It that I mean that just sounds <laughs> insane to. I don't know to be to be behind that because I think that snipers are are attractive. So I, I think like lots of reasons, but to be behind that kind of power versus an M4 is I think is part of what's so freaking cool about it, right? It's like man, like you're operating 
a very large caliber that does a lot of work from a very far distance. It's and the the amount of when I understand the the amount of math, the amount of calculation that has to go in when you're when you are at at uh, further distances is cool. You have to think so fast, so quickly, and be able to use your equipment so well. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is a huge asset to have somebody that's well trained on a long gun. Uh, because you can affect the battlefield in such a way that like your inner your enemy can't really uh they they don't have the capability or nobody that i've i with the exception of one time in 2013 i did counter sniper work against another sniper who was really really good uh with the exception of him uh that one I don't know two week period um it's just a huge asset to be able to reach out and touch and affect the battlefield. Um, and uh, even taking the gun aspect out of it, the main job of a sniper is it's not just target acquisition, but like surveillance, being able to like get eyes on it and know what you're looking at to help everybody else out is huge. You are the eyes for the team. You yeah. mean, you're, you're, hiding like you, you are like a drone right that that is able to see a, a, a get a bigger a better picture than the people that are on the ground that are in the weeds right yeah two two what is you say so what is counter like what is i didn't realize a counter snipering <laughs> event takes two weeks i mean that sounds like a very long chest well game. so um so in 2013 at this one location we were at um there was uh, an area in kind of north of where we were at, and there was this guy, uh, I can't remember his call sign to save my life, um, an Afghan, a Taliban sniper, who was a mercenary. Uh, so, like, he would work for local commanders. They would pay him, and then he would, if they paid him, he would come out and fight us. And then, if like, he was definitely not in it for any sort of like uh, patriotism or love of the Taliban. Like he was strictly <laughs> in it just for money, uh, but he was really, really good. We actually ended up finding out later on that he was trained by U.S. forces at one point back in 2008 or 2010. But um, <clears throat> he would do tactics like place a, uh, place a machine gun team three or 400 yards away and have them spray three or four rounds. And he would take his one well-aimed single shot from a different location as a way to confuse us. So we didn't know where the round, because four rounds would come in, three are like super high wild machine gun rounds. And then one well-aimed well round that would like hit a piece of glass sitting in front of somebody like it's bulletproof glass, but it would hit the glass on the truck, things like that. Damn. Um, but there was one time where I glassed, I knew he was out there. I knew he was out there and I glassed, I think for five and a half hours, basically I sat there looking through a spotting scope for like five and a half hours. And uh, Commit. And I knew he was there. I knew where he had to be too. Like I had narrowed it down for probably five or six spots. And I just kept scanning from, <clears throat> from one to the next. And I finally got tired and I bent down, like bent down to go pick up a Snickers bar <clears throat> that was down underneath. And I was getting out and he put around through my loophole. Which, loophole is like the, the area in the wall, like a hole in the wall that I was looking through. And so <clears throat> he put around through the loophole into the back of the wall behind me. So had I been there, he could have shot through my loophole and still killed me. But because he saw the light change difference of me moving is why he put the round through there. And so like that just speaks to how well, <clears throat> how well trained he was. <laughs> that is definitely I mean you're that close to death it's crazy uh, one second man. 
Yeah, you're good. We're going to make sure that Max doesn't die on the podcast. So he's going to grab some water, I assume. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, don't, don't die. No, yeah, we don't want that. But yeah, so that, uh, <clears throat> that was always an interesting one. <clears throat> um, it, it sounds rough. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's an experience. I think part of it's an experience that no, like very few people can, can have lived through. Right. Yeah. And I think that I have always been interested in, in this world, but also in asking the question because I feel like it was, it's always seen as taboo Yep. to ask. Is it, taboo to ask is it like what is it seen as in the community from like oh just another civilian asking what what does that look or feel like and, and like how do people how do people interact right um what <clears throat> what question are you talking about just asking in general about what it was like yeah like, like i mean that and then yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um i don't think it's necessarily taboo uh, I think it's how you frame the questions or how you ask and what you're attempting to get out of it. So like me personally, I don't, I don't get offended by things. Um, and I like to share any sort of lessons that I've learned with a broader audience, because if I can impact somebody else uh, by some lesson that I've learned, like that's a plus and that's a win for me. Um, I also fully understand and realize that very, very few people have done the kind of things that I've done. And I, it sounds weird saying that, um, uh, it always sounds strange when I talk about different things that I've accomplished. Uh, and I think that's part of like, I think that's, part of my imposter syndrome. Like I never feel like I've actually accomplished anything, but then if I look at my CV or I look like it's black and white, like these are things that I have accomplished. Um, I do still think it's incredibly beneficial to pass that knowledge on or pass different lessons learned on to people. I like it. Um, so do you mind finishing the story about your two week, Oh, yeah. Did you ever like keep finding the guy? No, no. Uh, we didn't end up getting him. He didn't end up getting any of us. Uh, and don't know what ended up happening to that guy. Uh, we parted ways, changed different. We were in a different area after that, and then he never came back. Um, who knows? He could be living his best life. He could be a farmer right now. Who knows? Did you ever consider doing because you can do contract work as well, right? Yep. Especially as somebody who's who's in Marsoc, that's kind of who they're <laughs> they're looking for. Was that ever something that you desired to get into? No. Uh, so my little brother was a Marine for four years. He was a sniper also. Uh, he got out and he contracted for the State Department for a while. Um, and I know a lot of guys that have gone that route and done that. For me. I always told myself that once I hang my boots up, like I'm done doing military stuff. So like I got out of the military, not really on my own accord, but because I couldn't do my job anymore. Um, and so I figured, why, why? uh, so I got into a motorcycle accident in 2016 oh, yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. and I had to re I had to relearn how to walk. Um, I remember that. but, after that, they basically told me, they go, hey, you you can go like do a desk job if you want and stay in the military, but you can't keep doing the job that you have been doing. And so for me, it was an all or none type of thing. And so I decided to get out. And then the only other thing that I wanted to do is go be a physician. And so that's why I'm going down the path that I am. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
I remember you said you had been to like an absurd amount of countries when like when, yeah. when we first met. I don't know what how it came up. You're like, yeah, I've been to like thirty one. What how many countries? Thirty one. Thirty one yeah. countries. Is when you're in Marsoc, are you like do you get more like secretive deployments? Like are you are you like your things that you like maybe cannot talk about? Is that a, a, a reality for Marsoc individuals? Um I would say it's a a very small percentage of guys do deployments like that that they can't talk about, but no, I, not me. Like every deployment that I've done, there's somewhere that I can talk about. Everything that I've done is something I can talk about. Um, <laughs> there are like politically sensitive stuff. Uh, like when we didn't have troops in Syria, uh, because it was a big topic, like we actually did have troops in Syria, like things like that. But no, not me. Like I've never done anything like that. Um, and so do you stay, do you stay pretty in the loop with those kinds of things? Honestly, no. Um, so most of the people that I was in the military with are all um, either have gotten out at this point or all pretty high up. Uh, like they're, they're all the bosses that we used to bitch about, which I think is kind of fun now. But um, like I, I talk with them occasionally, but usually we don't talk shop or talk about work. Like we'll just talk about dude stuff. Um, and then, I don't look at the news or anything. Like I haven't read a news article or watched the news since December of 2019. I just kind of cut it out because I felt like I was addicted to it. And I felt like it wasn't beneficial for me to keep a finger on the pulse of everything that was going on in the world. Uh, and so I just kind of cut it out and I realized it really doesn't matter. Like things that are important, like people talk about, I guess, and I'll get, kind of that water cooler type talk, uh, but I don't really immerse myself in it. I try to spend my energy on other things. What do you mean by water cooler type? type? Uh, it's just like a, it's like a saying for like in a corporate office, like everybody hangs around the water cooler and they ah. just bullshit like, but they don't really go super deep in the, into the topic. Yeah. I, I pretty much, stay away from all news because i feel that what what real impact am i going to have me talking about it with my spouse or friends or unless we're like really making moves to 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 make progress in certain areas and collaborating on specific issues then awesome like that that's great but otherwise me bitching about what biden or is doing and make like it, it does absolutely fucking nothing for sure other than fill space and what va and then it does it can i think it ultimately distracts people from what they can control in their own life and yeah maybe things aren't the best but what can you do in your even if it's even in your small in your local community and that can be in your home that can be in the neighborhood you live in that could be as as large as you can as, as you want to take that but what are you contributing that's real value not making fun or being upset about what people aren't doing right it, it's it seems so fucking pointless yeah. have you ever heard of the dunbar number i have not so um the dunbar number is i think he was an anthropologist uh, but he basically went around and correlated different uh, mammal brain size, the amount of animals that they hang out with in their in their inner circle, and then modeled a bunch of different uh, hunter-gatherer tribes and different tribal societies. Basically came up with the theory that um, the average person should have no more than 150 contacts. And so that's uh, kids, friends, parents immediate relatives, like 150 people is what our social connections are generally meant to evolutionarily to handle. And so 
when you hear about a tsunami on the other side of the world, uh, that's so far out of that 150, or if you hear about what's going on on Capitol Hill, or if you hear about uh, a school shooting somewhere, like these events are tragic, but I do think that they, because they're so far out of what we're evolutionarily developed to like, kind of be able to deal with and process, it leads to anxiety and existentialism. And I don't see anything positive or benefit, any sort of positive benefit that comes from it, uh, other than like what you said, like kind of escapism. And uh, uh, like, there's always the great quote, like Mother Teresa said, like, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. Like, if you... Damn, yeah. right. Wow, that's cool. If, I did not know. I did not yeah. hear that quote. That's a good quote. Yeah. If you spend time with the people that you're closest to, and like, that's how you make an impact. That's how you make change. That is a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful quote. Cause I don't, I just never. Yeah. I mean, that, that's exactly it. And even, even 150 people, I feel like is a shit ton of yeah. people. That's a lot of people. If you really think about it, trying to keep up with 150 <laughs> people, that's a lot of people, you know, like there, there is work. I, I went through my, like my phone and I was like, Man, I have like so many contacts. And I went like scroll down to the very bottom and it was like a thousand yeah. people. And I was sitting next to a guy who had 7,000. And I was like, I don't know that I have seven, like I could come up with 7,000 numbers to call like ever. Like if, if I got like four people around me, I don't even think I'd have 7,000 people, but I don't, I, I really don't need the seven, like for what, right? For like, sure. I, I'd rather build some really good relationships with, with like they're going to be more long lasting than, than just a bunch of people that I could like, how's it going? Good. How are you? good sounds good you know like that just seems like such a dry and unfulfilling life yeah for sure totally understand and agree with that and that's one of the things i've learned like as i've gotten older i think i don't know if everybody does it but especially me like i had a phase of my life where i was regularly going out to bars and i had like a i drank a fair bit uh a nightlife scene and uh, i had uh, a social circle of a bunch of people and I was always really friendly with them but like in the grand scheme of things like they didn't really contribute anything to my life and like they're all nice people like nothing against them but like I wasn't benefiting from our relationships and they weren't really either we were really just enabling each other to keep doing the same sort of thing and it wasn't until honestly like really slowed down and had kids uh, that I spend most of my time either with my wife and my kids or like the people that really mean the most to me. It, I think it makes that, that I mean, you're just, you're intentional with your yeah. time. I mean, and time will continue to move forward and move on. And you realize, and I don't know that the military helped promote this, but I, I think that you can find this outside of the military as well. Like it's it, it, though, sure. Like, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe it is compounded by that, those experiences, but even people that aren't living in there, haven't had that experience can find that there needs to be intention or there should be intention around the things and people that you communicate with and hang out with. Otherwise you're going to look 10, 15, 20 years down the road, look back and be like, man, I'm still doing these things. And some people that that's what they yeah. want. Right. But I like to be around more of the people that are pushing some boundaries and, and trying to push themselves to do bigger things. And when I saw you got into the to med school, I was like, this guy don't quit, man. This guy just does not fucking like he's fucking doing like you're making the most out of your experience of this, this one chance of life yeah. and, it's, it's, it's so fucking cool. Like it, it's admirable. And not a lot of people, like some people will hang their hat. Like, okay. I, like I, I went to Mars. Like I, like I did it right. Or I got my, I got my bachelor's. I did, like, I'm done. And it's like, well, no, like there's still, there's still much more. Uh, there's still a lot more to experience. Right. Thanks man. I really appreciate that. Uh, life's a single player game and it's, it's really 
at the end of the day, like, it's only, it sounds selfish to say it, but like, it's only me living my life. And so like, I want to get the most out of it for the finite amount of time that I'm here. I, I want to continue to talk, but we yeah. are reaching a, a, like a, a good, good length here. Yeah. So I don't want to keep you the, I don't want to keep you for too long. Um, but I want you to come back on because I, I just I want to hear more about uh, med school. Yeah. And if you don't mind, just before we leave, just ha- what year are you in and how long have you like, how is, how's it been going? Uh, it's been going great. I really, really enjoy it. Like I inherently it's hard, uh, but I wouldn't want it to not be hard. <laughs> like I want my physician to have gone through a rigorous med school, uh, but I really like the material and I love my classmates and I love the challenge. Like it's really great. Um, I am. In five weeks, I'll have finished my first year. Congratulations, yeah, man. I mean, that's, it's so fucking cool. I mean, thanks. It's, it's you're going to do big, I mean, you're already doing big things. You're, you're, you're not, you, you're, you, new, hard things aren't new to you, right? Like it's, it's just a, a new hard thing. And you said it at the very beginning, like do a hard decision now, easy life yeah. later. I like yeah. that. a lot, a lot of, a lot of good things. Um, I, I'll never forget you mean, you mean, I, I did not have the best experience on the power of team at one point in time and asked you for a letter and you wrote me, you wrote me, uh, you know, I went to sit against all this board of people. Cause I, I wanted, I was, when you were talking about your story about speaking up and I was like, you know what? Like I, 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 I try to say something and I went against the board rather than let people, I don't know, it maybe didn't work out the best, but, um, try to say something and stand up for something that I believed in. And maybe it didn't result in the best um, outcome. I think in that moment, I wanted to be a more of a more hands-on in that moment um, with the coaching aspect and thought that that's what everybody deserved on that team. Um, And though it resulted in me getting kicked off, I think it also resulted in, in kind of seeing who was willing to, to support it, who saw what I was trying to do. And so I'll always be very, very appreciative of, of, yeah, that. of course. And no problem. Like I thought you were in the right. Uh, and so of course I'll back up, back you up on that. I appreciate it. Good, good times getting in, and it resulted in, in at the very least a friendship. Yeah. So I think, I think it was a win I'd say. Yeah, for sure. All right, man. Well, I hope you have a good rest of the day again. Thank you for coming of on. Course. Um, anything that you would like to leave us with, you know, you, you go ahead and you, I'm going to, so you can say whatever you'd like to say, and I'm going to end the recording and then we'll stay on the call and then we'll go ahead and end cool. it off. Right? Yeah. I don't have anything uh, too pertinent or particular. I really appreciate you having me on and I'd love to come, come on again in the future. Oh yeah. Well, yep. Thanks man.